Thank you so much and thank you all very much for having me here. Yes, my name's Emma Alberici. I host Late Line for another week. Um, <laughs> yes. Anyway, <laughs> I am delighted to be here and join you today for the final plenary session of the Na National Housing Conference for 2017. The title of this session is The Safe House, Examining the Role of Housing in the Domestic and Family Violence Policy Response. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the traditional custodians of the land uh, and the Gadigal of the Aurora Nation as the traditional custodians of the place we now call Sydney. Let me also acknowledge some of the very generous conference sponsors. The official conference host partner of NHC 2017, the New South Wales Department of Family and Community Services. The Platinum Partner, the National Affordable Housing Consortium in partnership with Places for People UK and the Gold Partners, PACE, who've delivered the very handy conference app you have in front of you, Fast Connect, sponsor of the All Important Networking Lounge and Spotless, who proudly presented the Think Tank. Thank you also to all other conference sponsors and exhibitors, uh, the support you lend to this conference and New South Wales FACS in delivering this year's conference. And so to today's final plenary session, the Safe House, examining the role of housing in domestic and family violence. In this session, we'll explore initiatives stemming from the National Plan to Reduce Violence Against Women and Their Children. We have a stellar panel assembled for you to thrash out the issues. And uh, for the sake of brevity, because we are running over time, I'll make just some very brief comments about this issue. And I spent this week uh, poring over the results of last year's Victorian Royal uh, Commission into Family Violence. And of course, this is not a state or territory specific issue. It's a, a, an issue that affects everyone. Uh, everyone has a colleague, a friend, a neighbour or a family member who is experiencing violence. You might not know it, but the statistics tell the story. Last year, one million, more than one million women experienced violence, emotional abuse or stalking, more than one million. And we know that more than one woman a week is killed by an intimate partner or a former intimate partner. The issue is a crisis and the Royal Commission, witnesses to the Royal Commission, said responding to housing needs is central to everything else in responding to the crisis of family uh, and domestic violence. There were 227 recommendations submitted to the Royal Commission and several witnesses gave harrowing uh, evidence. And I'll just, uh, before I hand over to our first speaker, um, relay a quote from one of the witnesses that really spoke to the issue we're about to explore. She said, being homeless with a kid and having to constantly move from refuges to motels was a real hassle, especially without a car. Honestly, it just made me want to go back to the violence because I knew there was at least a roof over our heads and there I had somewhere to feed my son. I guess it gives you some idea of the enormity of the issue and it can be an issue of life or death when it comes to housing within the context of family and domestic violence. So let me now introduce you to our opening speaker for this session to give us a broad view of the state of community and government responses to this most important and pressing issue. And I am delighted to welcome to the stage Dr Heather Nancaro. She is the Chief Executive Officer of Australia's National Research Organisation for Women's Safety and she'll deliver our keynote. Welcome her to the stage, thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction, um, Emma. Um, I begin, it's my customary uh, duty, but also um, a privilege to me to be able to acknowledge here that we're on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past and present. I acknowledge the deep and continuing spiritual connection of Aboriginal people to the land upon which we are gathered to discuss the role of housing in domestic and family violence. 
I also acknowledge the Honourable Linda Burney, a proud Wiradjuri woman, and other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are with us at this gathering. I pay my respects to you, to your elders, past and present, and to your emerging leaders. It cannot escape our attention that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people across Australia are overrepresented in statistics on homelessness and on family violence. I encourage you to keep the traditional custodians of this land in your hearts and minds during our discussions and throughout your work to address family violence and related homelessness. The Honourable Prue Goward, Minister for Prevention of Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault, the Honourable Linda Burney, Federal Shadow Minister for Human Services, Associate Professor Kylie Valentine, distinguished guests, <coughs> I'm delighted to be giving this address at the Uhuri Conference. I'm also delighted uh, to be supporting the Uhuri funded inquiry into integrated housing support for vulnerable families led by Associate Professor uh, Valentine as a member of the inquiry panel. As you are no doubt aware, there is significant relationship between homelessness and domestic and family violence. Women and their children are particularly vul vulnerable to domestic and fam family, family violence related homelessness and research points the need for a range of strategies to effectively address the problem. I intend to expand on these points, um, briefly setting the scene for the panel discussion to follow. They are central to the aspirations of the Council of Australian Government's National Plan to Reduce Violence Against Women and Their Children, 2010 to 2022. This, this national plan was developed with a broader set of COAG priorities and reforms, and they include closing the, dap, uh, sorry, closing the gap on Indigenous disadvantage, the National Framework for Protecting Australia's Children, and The Road Home, the Australian Government White Paper on Homelessness. The National Plan describes the Road Home, released in 2008, as a strategic whole-of-government agenda for reducing homelessness to 2020. The Road Home Reform Agenda included commitments to increase spending on homelessness services by 55% as an initial investment on a 12-year reform agenda. Remember, this is back to 2008. Uh, to increase the supply of affordable housing through the National Rental Affordability Scheme, and fund 41 specialist homelessness projects across housing programs to fund more than 1,680 new units of accommodation. Now, as I said, it was, that's by dating back to 2008, and uh, I'm sure that many of you are aware of and uh, will be discussing or have discussed uh, advances since that time. The Road Home also states that women and their children who have been victims of violence are a key target group of the strategy. I will return to its specific strategies for this group a little later. But first, let me expand on the National Plan to Reduce Violence Against uh, Women and Their Children, which aims to achieve six national outcomes. Communities are safe and free from violence. Relationships are respectful. Indigenous communities are strengthened, and this one in particular recognises the specific issues facing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in regard to uh, domestic and family violence related homelessness and other uh, issues that uh, confront them and their well-being. Four, services meet the needs of women and their children experiencing violence and that sort services broadly, so government and community-based uh, services across a, wi a wide range of uh, uh, areas of uh, welfare, welfare and other uh, needs. Justice responses are effective and perpetrators stop their violence and are held to account. So these are the six national outcomes that the National Plan to Reduce Violence Against Women and Their Children aspires to. ANROSE was established under the National Plan to build evidence and assist the, uh, the take-up of evidence in policy and practice to help achieve these outcomes. Since the launch of its inaugural research program in October 2014, just a little over three years ago, ANROSE has completed more than 20 research projects, has published more than 70 research reports, papers and resources, and conducted more than a dozen major initiatives aimed at facilitating the take-up of evidence in policy and practice across Australia. ANROSE also produced the National Research Agenda to Reduce Violence Against Women and Their Children to guide the work of other research organisations such as AHURI, uh, whose work intersects with ours. Let me now turn to the key points of my presentation. When we think of domestic and family violence related homelessness, we usually think of women and children who have fled their homes and violent partners, fathers or stepfathers, 
and are living in crisis accommodation, staying with friends or relatives, or who may even be sleeping in tents or cars. Data from the Australian uh, Bureau of Statistics and the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare show us that domestic and family violence is the main reason people access homelessness services. It accounts for 25% of all cases, uh, sorry, of all such help seeking. The majority of people who seek homelessness services because of domestic and family violence are women with children. This is not surprising given the particular vulnerability of women to domestic and family violence and domestic and family violence, therefore, uh, uh, domestic and family violence related homelessness. First, as we know from the Australian Bureau of Statistics Personal Safety Survey, women are more likely than men to experience violence perpetrated in the home by someone known to them, and mostly that's by a current or former male intimate partner. Women are nearly three times more likely than men to ha have experienced violence by a current or former partner. The 2016 Personal Safety Survey shows that 92% of women physically assaulted by a male knew the perpetrator, and in 41% of those cases, the perpetrator was a previous partner. In fact, a previous partner was the most common type of perpetrator of physical assault against women. Therefore, leaving the violent perpetrator a violent partner does not necessarily end the violence. We often hear people say, why doesn't she leave? And not only should they be asking, why does he perpetrate violence against her, but it doesn't make sense to ask, why doesn't she leave, when we know that that doesn't stop the violence. In fact, we know that violence may escalate when a woman attempts to leave, and we know that the separation represents a significant risk factor for domestic violence-related homicide. Second, when women are less likely than men to have independent economic security and are thus more likely to depend on social housing options. Compared to those in the broader homelessness population and for a range of reasons including insufficient supply of affordable housing, women escaping domestic and family violence are more likely to cycle in and out of homelessness. Considering the Australian Bureau of Statistics 2009 definition of homelessness, however, it can also be argued that women and children can be trapped in a perpetual state of homelessness rather than cycling in and out of it. As the ABS explains, its definition is informed by an understanding of homelessness as homelessness, not rooflessness. The ABS constructed this definition from a conceptual framework centred on the following three elements. Adequacy of the dwelling, security of tenure in the dwelling, and control of and access to space for social relations. Women and children living with a coercive controlling partner and parent do not have security of tenure, and typically they do not have, a, have control of and access to space for social relations. Thus, even while housed with a partner and parent who perpetrates violence against them, women and children may be considered homeless. In these circumstances, they may experience the same effects of homelessness as others. Fear and anxiety in the context of an uncertain future, disruptions to social supports, employment and education, and poverty. Nevertheless, many women wish to remain housed with their abusive partner and their children. This arrangement enables them to stay connected to social networks, employment, extended family and children's school, recreational activities and friends. For some women, remaining with a violent partner may also be considered the safest option in the circumstances, recalling that violence often escalates when women uh, it, attempt to leave or leave the partner and it is a risk factor for homicide. Um, so therefore, in the uh, judgment of women who uh, have survived on a day-to-day -day basis, often for many years, uh, they, in their judgment, it's safer for them and their children to remain with a violent partner than, than it is to leave. Women do leave violent partners, their housing situations, uh, oh, sorry, when women do leave their violent partners, their housing situations impact on their and their children's overall soci social and economic well-being, as shown in ANRO's research produced by Nash Natasha Cortis and Jane Bullen in 2016. Housing and economic security, which are not mutually exclusive, are significant factors, though not the only ones, in decisions to leave or remain with a violent partner. For example, securing and maintaining independent accommodation may be further complicated by several factors such as the number of accompanying children, 
racial or other discrimination, disability or health concerns, and a poor tenancy record, and often that's due to property damage caused by a violent partner or other issues related to the perpetration of violence in the family home. In their 2016 research for ANROSE, Jan Breckenridge and her research team report that, women, that where women struggled to maintain independent accommodation, they were more likely to return to the perpetrator. And we've heard from Emma Alberici a, a quote from the uh, Royal Commission into Family Violence in Victoria, uh, a, a woman's lived experience of, of that particular circumstance. I have so far demonstrated that women and children can be homeless and subject to domestic and family violence whether or not they continue to live with a partner parent perpetrating the violence. So what is to be done? In 2008, the Council of Australian Governments adopted headline goals of halving all ho overall homelessness and offering supported accommodation to all rough sleepers by 2020, as reported in the Road Home, a national approach to reducing homelessness. Regarding domestic and family violence, the Road Home included a specific focus on enabling women to remain safely in the family home, with the perpetrator of the violence being removed. This is more just and more cost efficient than rehousing or relocating women and children who are victims of violence, where it is safe to do so. The Road Home also recognised that measures enabling women to remain at home are only appropriate for women and children where a thorough professional risk assessment indicates this is a safe option and that crisis accommodation remains an integral, an integral part of the national homelessness response. Features of new or expanded service models to support the Road Home's plan for women and their children to remain at home included the following. Specialist workers to assess safety and support needs, brokerage funds to stabilise housing or increase home security, and integrated criminal justice, health and community service policies and protocols. The ANROS meta-evaluation of safe at home initiative conducted by Jan Brackenridge and her team also concludes that the provision of crisis accommodation such as refuges and other specialist homelessness services is recognised by the evaluations as remaining a necessary part of service responses to domestic and family violence. However, many women desire to remain with their children in their home and connected to social networks, employment, extended family and children's schooling and friends. So this is a recurring theme from women's lived experience but also in uh, various inquiries and uh, current literature and current uh, research outcomes. Jan's research identifies the following four pillars of safe at home responses. A focus on maximising women's safety uh, by using, for example, legal provisions to exclude the perpetrator from the home and protect victims from post-separation violence, as well as proactive policing, safety alarms and home security upgrade. And, you know, since uh, there's, there are also other strategies such as um, uh, electronic monitoring of, um, of, of offenders of, of violence against women. Uh, second, a coordinated or integrated response involving partnerships between local services across government and non-government agencies, using safe at home as a homeless, homelessness prevention strategy, for example, ensuring women are informed about their housing options before the time of crisis and at separation, and providing support for women to maintain their housing afterwards. And fourth, enhancing women's economic security. These pillars provide a conceptual platform for developing and implementing safe at home strategies. Strategies to address points one to three are arguably uh, more developed than point four, enhancing women's economic security. In 2016, Anne Rose research conducted by um, Natasha Cortis and Jane Bullen identified the following priority areas for action to improve economic security for women subjected to partner violence and their children. First, they identified that initiatives need to promote information and, and awareness about economic abuse and the financial impact of violence. It is particularly important to understand the dynamics of economic abuse and how it may be perpetrated after separation, including through the courts and child support systems. Women participating in the research described how the systems intended to address economic harms associated with violence can be manipulated by perpetrators of violence such as where perpetrators inflict economic abuse by drawing out processes in the family court or domestic violence courts. This kind of systems abuse was also noted by Dr Ray Kaspiev's 
uh, in her research for Anne Rose on Parenting and Domestic Violence, released in June this year. Adequate resourcing is needed for specialist crisis assistance and accommodation support, financial counselling, employment programs, housing and access to justice uh, or representation in proper, for representation in property settlement, for example. Specialist financial counselling is also needed to support economic security for women after domestic and, domestic and family violence. This may include pathways to specialist domestic violence practice for financial, account, financial counsellors and co-location of specialist financial counsellors in uh, services responding to domestic violence. Quality employment and industrial protections include promoting supportive human resource management practices for women after violence or during violence, uh, including, uh, sorry, including domestic and family violence in anti-discrimination legislation and providing personalised, tailored support for women with multiple barriers uh, to obtaining and keeping jobs. Improving responses by Centrelink and employment services may include amending the job seeker classification instrument to recognise DV as a barrier to employment, so that allocating resources to women following violence is properly recognised in employment service providers' contracts and performance indicators. Better integration of and collaboration between services generally reduces the burden on women managing themselves across multiple agencies. In particular, promoting women's economic security requires that a wide range of agencies and professionals be brought together, including employment services collaborating with specialist domestic violence services, commercial players whose policies affect debt, loans and access to basic services such as banks, utility and telecommunications companies and uh, real estate agents. Finally, it's important to develop, document and evaluate innovative partnerships and successful collaborations between mainstream and specialist services as examples of good practice to be followed. I'm sure that there have been many examples of good practice discussed at this conference, in already, so at this conference already, and I hope to hear more in this session. In summary, women and their children are particularly vulnerable to domestic and family violence related homeless, whether or not they leave the abusive partner, parent. The relationship between domestic and family violence and homelessness and breaking the cycle of domestic and family violence related homelessness is complex. We do have evidence based solutions but they are not quick fixes. Ending domestic and family violence related homelessness takes effort and commitment from diverse sectors working together. A local example is the Pathways Home, Tra Pathways Home Transitional Housing Project launched by Minister Goud on the 21st of November. The project is a collaboration between PACE Foundation, Women's Community Shelters and Bridge Housing. It manages housing that is land bank for future development, providing a home for women and children leaving emergency accommodation, the Women's Community Shelters. The provision of stable housing for up to 18 months enables women and children to re-establish their lives with support and services and the development of skills for managing finances and other resources. I believe that the ANROS funded evidence produced by Jan Breckeridge and her team, Natasha Cortese and Jan Bullen, and also the Ahuri funded evidence to be produced by Kylie Valentine and her team will assist the work of such initiatives across the country. I also have, hope our discussions at this conference will build on that evidence and contribute to women and their children living in safe homes free from domestic and family violence. Heather, and uh, if, you, if you take a seat uh, over there, I'm now pleased to welcome our impressive lineup of panellists for this session. If you can all make your way to the stage, I will introduce you and uh, take up a position alongside you so we can launch into our discussion. Minister Prue Goward needs to uh, leave on time, as do some other panellists, so we'll try to launch in straight away. So please let me welcome to the stage our panellists, <laughs> the Honourable Prue Goward, New South Wales Minister for Social Housing and Minister for the Prevention of Domestic and Family Violence. Linda Burney. Hello. Linda Burney, of course, on the end here, the Honourable Linda Burney is the Federal Shadow Minister for Human Services. 
We have Associate Professor Kylie Valentine, who is from the Social Policy Research Centre in the University of New South Wales. And David Fisher is the Chief Executive Officer of Housing Plus. Please welcome them all to the stage. Also, um, I invite you all to submit questions through the app or we'll do it the old-fashioned way and we'll have a roving microphone uh, toward the end and I'll uh, make sure we have plenty of opportunity for you to all engage in the discussion. The first question I wanted to ask broadly is how consistent are the policies that have been developed around this issue between the states and territories and nationally? How much coordination is there? How well does it work in terms of a, a policy mix? I might start with you, Prue Gowan. Well, thanks, Emma. Well, I suppose because uh, the responses are all in, in the hands of state agencies, uh, unsurprisingly, each state's developed its own uh, responses. Uh, some are more systematised than others. My intention is to have a well-developed system in New South Wales. Uh, the federal role is in things, as we've seen recently, such as the introduction of a national domestic violence protection order scheme, so that uh, if you move into state or travel into state, uh, your order can now go with you. Uh, but frankly, the role of uh, a federal government in this area, as I found when I worked for a federal government, is extremely limited. And I think we have to agree... Sorry to interrupt you, just to remind you all, Prue Goward, of course, was working with John Howard. That's yes, what you're that's referring right. to, yes. And we tried to do something about it, and uh, our role was extremely limited. So I'm all uh, hats off to uh, the Turnbull government for now giving us... Uh, or bringing together the states to have this uh, domestic violence national order scheme. Uh, but I think some states are more systematised and more organised than others. Uh, it's been... Uh, I mean... Domestic violence is an issue that's sort of grown up, uh, people have grown up to understand over the last 20 and 30 years differently and unsurprisingly, uh, I think that the, there is a patchwork, uh, but we, I think we now know what it's about. Uh, the research is uh, very strong on what causes it, where we need to go, the role of housing, uh, and there's really no excuse anymore for governments not standing back and taking a strategic look at what their services system looks like and ensuring that there's a consistent response for women, particularly that there is an effort to... You make an effort on prevention, that you uh, absolutely focus on breaking that cycle of violence, uh, but that you accept things such as, uh, on average, a woman will take will leave six times before she permanently leaves a violent relationship. We need to get that down to one. We need to get that down to two, three. But we have to accept the complexities of intimate relationships and, uh, as we've all acknowledged, that women uh, won't always leave a violent relationship, particularly if they don't have financial independence. And there's a lot more to be said, but that's a, a long answer which basically says we should have syst a systematised approach. I think uh, states are now beginning that work and that's certainly my determination in New South Wales. Thank you very much. David... You are, I guess, the representative of those services on the ground who are the direct responders to the women in crisis at that moment when, I guess, they're calling triple O, those first responders are coming and then you are trying to help solve the immediate problem of where do they take their children, where do they go to seek some sort of safety and stability. Has this national plan on the ground been, been felt in terms of, does it feel like you're kind of um, getting to a point where the system is such that these, these women can feel protected and safe for, for an extended period of time in their living situation? I mean, I'd like to start by saying that the, um, the, the national plan uh, and the state's individual plans, uh, I think, show significant political leadership across all of those governments for several years. Uh, I don't think um, that should be sort of go unnoticed. 
Uh, it's significant because it's bipartisan support. It's mm. lasting over many, many years. And as the minister says, each state does it slightly differently. But nevertheless, there's a consensus of support. And I think that's um, done many things at, at um, a community level. First of all, I think awareness of domestic violence um, has risen enormously because of campaigns at federal level as well as state level. And I think that has uh, created a much more positive environment that we experience on the ground in relation to um, individuals, community groups, businesses who want to step up mm. and take action to address domestic family violence. So I think that's something that I think came through the national plans and the state plans that it's no longer a subject, a taboo subject, that's no longer something that mm. we can't talk about. Uh, I think that's really important because it sets the scene for uh, helping victims who, uh, who otherwise felt um, perhaps more isolated. And it helped a lot, I suppose, to have Rosie Batty well, make the very salient point that even people with lovely homes experience terrible, shocking domestic violence to bring the matter to people's living rooms, yeah. that this is not some other person you don't know. This is everyone, and it affects well, all it's, sorts of people. It's, it's your introduction. It's one in three Australian women, really. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I think that's got to be said. I think there's sort of long-term political leadership being shown. But you've um, been working in this space for how long? Well, Housing Plus is a community housing provider, uh, and what we noticed uh, some 10, 12 years ago was that we were losing um, a number of our tenants because of domestic family violence. And um, we, we, our solution was to develop uh, within our organisation uh, an arm which tries to tackle domestic family violence. So we are a specialist homeless service provider. We have, um, we, we're contracted to government to provide safer pathways, uh, safety action meetings, uh, all of those interventions that we'll no doubt talk about. Um, uh, so that's what we've got, you know, we've got workplace DV programs, uh, a whole range of uh, specialist staff to try and help um, those, those victims. But coming back to your point about, you know, what, what does it mean on the ground? I think the first action plan was about setting the, base, the baseline, uh, understanding the issue, uh, raising awareness. The second action plan, which is where the states came in, uh, was about trying to tackle it. And certainly for New South Wales, we've got safer pathways programs. We've got stay, staying home, leaving violence. These are, these are really effective programs to improve the, uh, the response and help victims. And I know in other states, such as Queensland, where they have uh, specialist domestic violence uh, courts. So this, the, maybe the states are responding to it differently, but I think there's lots of progress and, and good examples of how uh, the, the strategies have actually been implemented. Uh, Kylie, uh, when we talk about homelessness in this particular um, context, there's often, I guess, the thought that you want these women and their children leave home to go somewhere else. Is there also a focus, or should there be more of a focus, on helping these um, women and children stay in their in their homes, mm -hmm. in the homes that they're actually in? Yeah, I, th I, th I think that that's right. And to go back to your first question of how coordinated or how cohesive are national policies, uh, there is an increasing recognition and increasing efforts to support women to stay, to stay safely in their homes. Uh, there are examples or there are instances where that's working extremely well. So much of it though is dependent on the kind of configuration of services and support, the responsiveness of police, the integration of services. So there are some instances where it's, it's working really well. There's a lot of excitement, there's a lot of energy. Um, however, one of the really great things about having this session at this conference is that there has been a lot of recognition for a while about domestic violence as a cause of homelessness, but not necessarily as a housing problem. And so it's really great to have housing talked of more broadly mm. as, a, as a domestic violence issue, rather than simply um, it being a problem for homelessness, which doesn't necessarily equate to a housing response. Linda, we know that women in rural and regional areas are actually more prone to violence and uh, domestic abuse uh, be because of their isolation, I guess. And I was horrified to see the statistics that 
uh, Indigenous women are 30 to 80 times more likely to experience family and domestic violence. Is there a different policy response necessary or already underway for that cohort and more broadly people in regional and remote communities? Is there a different response necessary? There is a different, a different response that's needed. Um, can you all hear me? Yeah. Oh, good. Um, hi, everybody, and thank you for having us, and thank you for that fantastic opening, um, those opening remarks. Uh, there is an absolute need for more effort and a very different response, I think, for rural and regional, uh, regional people, and in particular, in Aboriginal communities. Um, my sister asked that question earlier. I mean, one of the things that I find absolutely horrifying, um, and this is with you know, my own, own relatives in small country towns, where there, it's, not, it's not something that's unusual. It's actually mm. almost part of what's expected in a relationship that they don't see a lot of a lot of young women in particular think and have seen domestic violence intergenerational intergenerational mm -hmm. so um, it's not seen as something that's um, uh, that's necessarily the way other people see it and I think the other thing particularly for a lot of rural communities small Aboriginal communities is everyone's related um, and if you leave a relationship. Um, then where do you go? Um, there isn't the availability of housing, that's for sure. There's often not a safe house to go to. Um, and you go to a relative, or very often uh, you are then, you are the person that's got the problem, not the person mm. that's, uh, that's mm. taken out the abuse on you. And you end up being um, um, pilloried because of that. But I do think the other thing that's really important, uh, particularly for our young women, is, and more importantly for our young men in rural and regional, and perhaps in the city too, is to actually understand what domestic violence is. It's not just the broken arm, it's not just the broken eye socket. Um, you all know, know this inherently. It is about, I want to see who's rung you today. I want to see how much you're, I want, I want that debit card. Um, it's that kind of control. And for young women that get into early relationships, they often don't understand that that's unacceptable and a lot of young men don't understand that that, is, that actually constitutes domestic violence. And just to quickly finish um, your answer, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the focuses of the Indigenous Labor Caucus in the place that um, I inhabit, um, one of our priorities is in fact domestic and family violence. And you cannot have this discussion without understanding where it's come from, why it's like it is, particularly in Aboriginal communities, and the intergenerational trauma that we, um, we must address because it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it, it carries on uh, through generations, and that's crucial. And that is not a policy um, response that's well understood, but it's starting to be. Thank you, Linda. Heather, money, is there enough of it? <laughs> uh, look, I, I mean, I think that, um, you know, clearly there's, there's always room for more resources, but I think that we also look, need to look at uh, more creative ways better collaborations, you know, I think money's not always the answer. Mm. Um, I mean, uh, our own organisation, I would say that ANROS could do with more funding to do more research, you know, and I think most services would say that they could do with more money, but I don't think we need, we, that should not Are you stop funded us federally? From, Sorry for the uh, So ANROS is funded jointly by the Commonwealth and every state and territory in Australia as an initiative under the national plan, so it was one of the foundational pieces David referred earlier to uh, the first, national, first action plan of the national plan was building the foundations and ANROSE is one of those foundational pieces to support implementation of the national plan. So we, we have a contract with the Commonwealth Government but we're funded jointly by all of the states and territories and the Commonwealth 
on a pro, uh, pro rata population base. Um, I've got just one more question for all of you before I'll, I'll hand over to you. And do do remember that you can submit questions through the um, through the <laughs> this fandango. It's actually thing. working. <laughs> it's working, but I haven't had any on this session yet. So um, do that, or otherwise, as I said, we'll do it the um, the old economy way. And uh, I'll get to you very shortly. But the question uh, more broadly that I wanted to ask was just around uh, whether. Uh, well, and, and obviously, we can only talk about housing in this particular forum, although the issue is so much more complicated than that. We all recognise that as, as a, a starting point. But how do we go about keeping... Is part of the challenge keeping this front of mind since Luke Batty, the 11-year-old Victorian boy, was so tragically killed by his father in 2014 his mother, Rosie Batty, who has become the symbol of this issue, was Australian of the Year in 2015, the year that we saw one of the highest numbers of women killed, and those numbers are doggedly not shifting. And, you know, it's still such a crisis. How do we keep it front and centre, especially given the incredibly crowded uh, agendas of political parties and governments? How do we put this to the top. Is that part of the challenge? I'll start with you, yeah, Heather, and yeah, we'll come around. Sure. Look, I, I mean, I, th I would say, I mean, I've worked in the field for 35 years and Minister Goward's been in the field maybe not quite that long, but certainly we've worked together on, you know, for many years. It's always been on, on the agenda. Well, for the last 35 years, 40 years, it's been on the agenda at some level. It's never gone away. We've had specialised domestic violence laws for 30 years and, and more in this country. Mm. So, I, you know, and I think what Rosie Batty was able to do was to engage the broader community sector in a way that wasn't able to be achieved before. So she was really a catalyst for uh, the, the work that we need to do on changing attitudes and beliefs and uh, behaviours in the broader community in a way that wasn't done previously. I think because we've now got that and we've got uh, corporates involved, we've got people who are wanting to fund community women's shelters, you know, we've got... I don't think we can go back from that. I don't know that we will be able to maintain it uh, at such a high, high visibility as it was in 2015 all the time, but I would say, based on my experience, that it is something that comes and goes in terms of uh, visibility in the media in other ways. And so when it's not high visibility, we shouldn't believe that it's gone away and, and that it won't come back in terms of that level of visi visibility. So we just have to keep going at it. And the more that we, the more the snowballing that we can get in terms of people joining uh, the movement and joining the work and collaborating, the, the less you know risk there is of it going away as an issue. What do you think on that, Carla? Uh, I I agree very much with Heather, and I think that the more that we know about um, the, the circumstances and the more that we know about violence and its effects, the more that we realise that just as this is something that's experienced by women in different circumstances, with different needs, so the, 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 the violence is different, the needs will be different, this is not something that has a single kind of entity mm. and requires a single sort of solution. Mm. So the, the more we realise how complicated it is, the more complicated yeah. it, it gets in a way. And one of the um, things that, that policies and programs are quite good at doing is defining a problem and then working on that problem. We get less good at um, responding to people having more than one thing going on in their life. And quite often, um, victims don't behave the way that society thinks that they should. They're not just victims. Mm. Perpetrators aren't always only perpetrators. Mm. So I think there's really good recognition in principle that this is an important thing that we, that we need to respond to. But it's, it's the, the different manifestations of it and the different complexities of it are the things that I think are really going to be hard to keep in mind. Uh, and Prue, in particular, oh, could, I could want you to the same question. Yes, yes, absolutely. But as well as that question, I also wanted to ask you what role childcare services play here too. Because the more I thought on this issue, I thought, so you've got a, a woman and, and, and a child or children fleeing a situation. How does she keep her accommodation? She obviously needs to be able to find some income in mm. some way, and if she's also got young children, I imagine that too. And when we talk about the broader issue, <laughs> rather than just focusing on the housing as well, yeah. is that also part of the problem here? That that pa potentially childcare services aren't there, such that she can feel 
or you know the support in terms of financial support and so on so that if she doesn't have a network of people around her to provide that support that that it's there in some other capacity such that she can go to work and continue her accommodation requirements? Well, I mean, obviously, if you're going to leave violence permanently, uh, you need either strong welfare supports or strong income. Uh, and, of course, childcare is fundamental to women with children. So uh, that is a great role that the federal government can play in supporting uh, the cost of childcare, which is so prohibitive uh, for some families. Uh, but of course it's means tested and people starting out in the workforce actually get, I think, uh, quite significant subsidies to their childcare. But let me go to the first question, which was um, how do we keep this going? Uh, I think the important thing about the Rosie Batty case was that it wasn't people like somebody else. These are not people who we don't know anymore. I mean, as Linda has just described, of course, uh, indigenous women have been murdered every week, every day for years, and nobody noticed. Suddenly, it's a middle class, articulate woman, and it's become a national issue. Um, uh, I, this is not a criticism of Rosie, of course. I'm just saying uh, there has been, a, and I've been around in this area for a long time, there has been a very bad tendency to see domestic violence as the problem of people who aren't competent, aren't like us, and really it's just behind closed doors and would you please all go away uh, and sort it out yourselves. So I think what Rosie's case has done is said, actually it is about us, people like us, and now for the first time I see a community response when we say things like, it's about your credit card, it's about does he have your Facebook uh, login details. Is it, it, it is about him ringing you at work 50 times a day. And we've now got people saying, yes, that's right, uh, controlling your bank accounts in a way that I don't think people appreciated or even believed was a form of domestic violence 10 years ago because domestic violence happened to other people. So, yes, we keep it going. And I think as we can enrich the conversation by referring uh, to the complexities and the fact that it affects all walks of life, all uh, stratas of society, I think that helps. But the other issue uh, is for governments to keep on this game, uh, to keep pushing, and with a real determination, as Heather says, it's not just about the money. You have to have a determined way to do it. Um, and it comes back to accountability. So, for example, the police now have uh, KPIs that commanders in New South Wales are supposed to meet uh, for uh, perpetrator surveillance and for keeping their eyes on, on victims. Uh, we have criminal justice uh, requirements. I have uh, KPIs uh, as a ministry uh, and um, uh, the Premier's priorities about reoffending rates in domestic violence. Give it a profile and I can't tell you how big the pressure is on a minister when that's up, when you're you're, you're told that your job is to reduce domestic reoffending by 15% by 2020. Is that, is that your KPI? That's, that's, my, that's one of my KPIs, and it's all... How's it uh, going? Uh, not great. Um, <laughs> uh, but our reforms have only just begun. I can't stress enough the importance of transparency and highly visible targets for governments, for ministers, but also government agencies such as the police. Uh, that is what, that is the mechanism that will enable us to keep carrying this on. And as part of that accountability, the Women's National Safety Survey, which has been running since um, John Howard's time, uh, and keeps, the, keeps that focus on the results and, and is very obvious about where we are failing and where we're not meeting our targets, I think that enables us to have a national and a state conversation that remains well informed and enables uh, uh, the, the sector and the community to have a clear understanding of what we're doing well, what we're not doing well, and, and how even internationally we compare. So we can't just keep a conversation going because we rely on terrible homicides to, from time to time, become public interest. We have to have determined governments with ministers and administrations that set themselves tough targets that they make visible and we expect you to keep us accountable for. Uh, and it's worth acknowledging and recognising the federal government recently stopped um, 
stopped perpetrators uh, cross-examining their victims in, in the court. family law court. Yes, and that was this huge development, I think, yes. in this space. Yeah. But do you, uh, Prue, share some some concerns that are still out there about the way the judiciary works, the family court works in terms of dealing with children and handing them back to abusive parents and so on? Oh, I think that it, it is. There are ongoing problems well, with with the family court. I mean, it's not my jurisdiction, and I'm mm. unwilling to make too many comments about it. Linda might want to, uh, but uh, th there's no doubt that the family court have started to move on their understanding that when women complain about domestic violence and express fears for their safety and their children's safety in a separation, that they're not just being vindictive and they're not making it up because they want um, greater access and less mm. access for him out of some sort of sense of revenge. And I'm afraid I think that's been part of the mm. thinking in the past. But mm. uh, there's no doubt. Uh, that the, the judici judiciary overall has come a long way. I mean, I remember sitting in courtrooms and hearing magistrates wag their finger at a woman and say, well, make him a better meal. Go home, this is a family matter, nothing to do with us. Um, those days are well and truly over, but uh, I, I, undoubtedly there is further thinking the judiciary could do, particularly when it comes to recognising the mental illness aspects that might accompany a perpetrator. Uh, we need more perpetrators to actually have a mental illness response if we can see that that's their problem. Uh, where, uh, and in this state, we are now really creating very strong pathways for perpetrators at the remand levels as an option, as an alternative to remand, uh, having conditions on them such as, I would hope, being sent to a drug and alcohol service to manage their ICE problem. Uh, which makes them so violent. So there's a lot more that the judicial system can do, particularly with perpetrators, that I think will help us uh, reduce the violence. But it's a journey. Thank you. David, in terms of keeping it um, at the fore, but also for you specifically, what is the priority, do you think, in terms of uh, government responses well, at the I, moment? I, I think in terms of keeping it at the fore, um, as I said before, I think the fact that uh, domestic family violence is um, a kind of part of the language. It's common. People want it tackled. I think that um, isn't going to go away. Um, the, the awareness of domestic family violence and how it affects communities is out there. And I think um, communities expect uh, their political leadership to respond at a local, state and national level. So, In, in terms of keeping women and children safe, what do you think at the moment is Look, the priority or something yeah. we're not talking about that we should be? Well, maybe just drawing on some of the points that Heather made in her introduction. Um, one of the most vulnerable parts of uh, a victim's journey is when they decide to leave. And as the minister mm. says, that can be multiple times. Uh, and it's for all the research reasons that Heather alluded to that people don't do that, victims don't do that, and find it difficult to, to sustain that. So I think one of the things that... Um, I would say, and, it's, and look, there's many things. This is quite a challenging um, problem. But one of the things I think is about providing good quality um, crisis accommodation that allows uh, victims to feel safe and protected um, to encourage them to leave. And I think crisis accommodation designed and delivered in the in a, in, a, in a modern way, so support independent living, um, is one part of improving the, the service to victims. Because while victims are in uh, crisis accommodation and feel confident that they'll be safe and secure, but also not locked away, away and feel institutionalised, part of the I think the approach has to be that it's part of the community. They're not isolated. But while they're there, which I think the Victorian government's uh, Royal Commission said no more than six weeks, that they should be there. Mm. While that <coughs> happens, then the perpetrator should be held to account through police and other legal services. And while that's happening, the other pathways, the staying home, leaving violence programmes, which is about preparing the family to go back to the family home, can, can do their work. So... It's not one thing, it's about integrating crisis accommodation with uh, holding the perpetrator to account as well as um, preparing the family to go back to their family home. 
And so if, I, if you were to ask for my Christmas uh, list, my Christmas present, I would say it's about making uh, greater provision of crisis accommodation and transitional affordable housing. Transitional. Yep. And I think those are the things that would, would have a, a lasting impact on helping victims feel encouraged and supported to leave and actually be able to leave for good. So that's a money issue? It, it's not, it, it isn't, it, it's about how the money is found. I mean, I think the example that, again, Heather mentioned before, where uh, Women's Community Shelters Bridge, uh, that the Minister referred to uh, a couple of weeks ago, is a good example. There's lots of good co-funding models out there. Uh, whether or not, because of the awareness, because of the, corp the support that corporate and private businesses want to provide um, to help solve this problem. So there's... I think there's a, there's, there is an appetite for individual businesses and businesses collectively to support the capital, the construction of uh, crisis centres. And if those services are coordinated and located in that kind of accommodation, it's, it's very efficient. So it, it takes cost out of the whole system, which is good for government. Does your party, Linda, have a policy to take to the next election around this issue? Well, I couldn't possibly tell you that right <laughs> now. <laughs> I know, we won't tell anyone. <laughs> um, the answer is yes, and it's a very, very high priority. Um, um, it's not my portfolio area, but um, part of my portfolio came up um, in Heather's speech, and that is the way in which uh, Centrelink and other such organisations actually respond. I have just seen um, some ridiculous decisions uh, made by government agencies that make the situation worse for the person that is seeking the assistance. And I, th I, I would say, well, why wouldn't you just use your common sense? If there is a woman standing in front of you that's clearly in distress and has clearly experienced domestic violence, why would you say this is going to take six weeks? We're going, why would you sit that person down and try and do something um, immediately? There is so much to say. The other thing that I uh, believe is important uh, for government, uh, particularly at a local, state and federal level, is giving women or people that are experiencing violence proper, proper leave. Um, ten days domestic violence leave is what, is what we're, we're talking about. To do all the sorts of things that you've heard Prue and others, others talk about and not be ashamed and have to cover it up or use their annual leave to actually stay, stay alive in many circumstances. And I think the final thing, or final two things that I'd say uh, without repeating what other people have said um, is that this is everyone's business. Um, and it is the way in which it should be it should be dealt with. It is how the emergency services at the, at the hospital, be it in Tennant Creek or be it in uh, Taramara, respond to obviously a child that's come in with a broken arm or a woman that's come in because of violence. It is the way in which uh, this is dealt with in our school curriculum. It is a whole range of that integration that people have been talking about that I don't, see, I don't think we're seeing enough of. And it shouldn't be um, relying on champions in government. It should be, um, and I think it is, that bipartisanship is crucial on this issue. This should not be a political football ever. This has to be something that's a bipartisan approach agreed to, and unfortunately I think sometimes it still remains a political football. And the final thing that I would say um, is this, uh, is, is to put a human face on, onto this issue is really important. Um, these are not statistics, and often we talk in terms of statistics. They are people we know, they are our brothers and sisters, they are, they are our cousins. And um, you know, there was one shocking incident in a small country town and it didn't even make a Sydney newspaper. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just horrendous. So it's also the responsibility of, of the fourth estate to work closely uh, with, with us that are doing work in this area 
and last but not least, the community sector and community providers are absolutely fundamental to the way in which governments make decisions. Thank you so much, Linda. And unfortunately, I won't be able to take your questions for the floor. I didn't get any on the iPad, so that might just be my lack of technical <laughs> know-how. Um, the minister needs to go to another engagement, so we do need to wrap it there. But uh, before we end this session formally, we have a, a short video we'd like to show you. Before I do that, I'll ask you, please, to join me in thanking our panellists, Heather Nankara, Kylie Valentine, Prue Goward, David Fisher and Linda Burney. Thank you all so much for your time.